day seven of the August 97 10-day retreat in spring water. <coughs> cold it was yesterday and how hot it is right now. Wind blowing. Wind blowing and breath flowing. Are they different? Someone brought up A mention of a group discussion last night. I wasn't there, so this is second or rather third hand. What was being said, according to this report, was that there can be endless discoveries of what's going on, what is arising in oneself and relationship. It's endless. And the joy of this endlessly discovering something like that. And this person added, I don't see it this way. I used to do psychological work and that was just peeling layer and layer and layer of an onion. Not always more layers. Endless layers. Although that metaphor or analogy doesn't quite hold because what's inside the layers upon layers upon layers and still some layers? What are they all around? What's in the middle of all these layers? At the center of it. When it's all peeled off. This is just an aside to the onion analogy. This person said, coming from psychological work, this is not what I came to spiritual work for. I wanted to leap over this whole process of peeling off all these layers of myself. Just discovering more stuff So let us, let us look this morning at the twofold aspect of this work of listening and looking and questioning silently as well as with each other. There is indeed the discovering of all the stuff that binds us, that confines us, distorts our perceptions, all the projections onto other people, the imagery about oneself, all of this beckons to be discovered. Because it constricts, it hides, it smogs up what is in essence clear and bright and undistorted. So the other aspect of this meditative work, call it what you will, I've never found the right word for it, 
is to come upon that which is undistorted, unconfined, unlimited, free and without layers. And this goes hand in hand, this twofold aspect. Obviously, if there's nothing going on inside, no holding back, no resisting, wanting, fearing, then there's nothing to discover about this conditioned structure, which I call myself. And there's truly just the wind blowing, leaves rustling. But as soon as the thought arises, I'm doing it right, I've got it. I'm better than others, or I'm not as good as others, as others, etc. It needs to be seen, discovered, so it doesn't begin to cloud the vision and create a scenario all its own in which we happen to like to live, the scenario of our own ideas and pictures. It's a habit. We share it, we reinforce each other in that habit of living in pictures about each other and the world. So, if a thought arising is discovered, it doesn't begin to spin on and on and on, creating a separate world of me and you in imagery. So, as for meeting together and discovering things about ourselves and the joy of it, the fun of it. Can one look and ask oneself, what is the nature of looking, of listening and attending? Or is there just a compulsion to collect things about oneself, like stamps? more findings about me and sort of storing them up. Storing them in the story about myself and others. And not going further to look at the discoverer. To discover the discoverer? the desire maybe to be something in a discussion or to get something, to help somebody. Not that these are in and of themselves wrong, but they need to come to light or else something is missed. <coughs> the clarity, the emptiness of our underpinning. in which there is nothing to collect, nothing to hang on to, nothing to become, nothing to lose, nothing to be. Yes, there's a beauty in discovering at any moment the hooks, the hang-ups, the wantings, and let go of them. Not I let go of them, discovering them, seeing them clearly in this energy of presence. They cannot keep hooking or seducing. If they do, then the attention is not complete. And that's how we live a good part of the time, also our retreat life, with incomplete attention. A little bit of it, but it's overlaid by all kinds of other elements, layers of wanting, of resisting, of fearing, 
what could be discovered. Or this incredible urge to be something. The fear of being nothing. In this connection, somebody mentioned to me that it is indeed possible for there to be transparency of all of these thoughts about, which are confining, spin, in enclosing. Thoughts can become transparent. They are transparent to a mind that is open. Pictures, projections, and how they so quickly hook into the physiology of aching, paining, wanting, fearing, discomforting. But then this person went on. There are deeper thoughts, very hard to give up, very hard to even approach. Deeper thoughts about myself. And a lot of people have mentioned that over the years even. This deep, shadowy feeling of myself being here. The I thought. Why is it so hard to unearth, to come upon that? Maybe not so hard to come upon it, because one notices it, one feels it, intuits it sort of let it be shining in full light of attention as a thought, not as a reality. Because until it is fully unearthed, in full light, full freedom of looking, it is believed to be a reality. Keep watching that I thought. And often it isn't just an I thought. This particular person said it is, I am a good worker, whatever the job is that they're doing. I'm good at this. And the, the deep foundation of one's existence around this being good in one's work. It wasn't said with pride. It was sort of a, like a foundation. This, the basic structure of my going about my daily business being good. And as we were looking at it and talking, elaborating on it, it's a marvelous thing if one does one's work and feels it's, it's working out all right. The kids are learning something. There's a good atmosphere in the classroom if one happens to be a teacher. something alive in oneself and the others as creativeness. This is, this is all happening and is going on. And then the mind thought, as is its habitual way, abstracts from it, I'm a good teacher, which in itself is sort of borderline. It's still a statement of fact, but it is very likely to explode into feelings about my goodness and removing, removing us from the actuality, preferring to live in this idea or at least milking it, addicting to it, because it gives infusions of good energy. We talked about that earlier. One thought of a pleasant nature about good things happening or good things that did happen, how good I am, and an infusion of pleasantness, happiness. And the opposite, one thought about having done wrong, failing. Opposite effect physiologically. 
depressed, deflated, pained, worried, anxious, guilty. All these words describe not just mental but also physical states. So why not see what one is doing and see it openly, not try, think that I have to, that's another idea, I have to deprecate myself, I gotta take myself out of the picture. No, to, 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 to watch it all like an ongoing dance and watch the tendency to abstract from it and not fall for it. It's not necessary. The situation as it unfolds from moment to moment speaks for itself. It doesn't need any commentary, any report cards. To, to be very astutely aware of that tendency in the mind. To make oneself into something good or bad and then suffer or pleasure from it. Just to see it. If the seeing is free and clear, that's enough. The mind will quiet down and the awareness will stick with the openness of this present moment of infinite potential. So, we, we were saying it's not just the I thought, it is the quickly added I am this thought. The I thought itself, what is it? Sometimes one wakes up from deep dreamless sleep. I'm sure all of us have experienced this at one time or another. Waking up and not knowing where what or one is or where what is going on. The waking up has not yet triggered consciousness to fall into place and tell one in thought and image what one is, where one is, what it is all about, that it is a retreat, what day. And where I'm sleeping, probably first night, people waking up don't know where they are. I sleep a lot in different places and almost guaranteed the first night in a new place, I, I either don't know where I am or I, I'm looking for the doors and things in the old place. <laughs> <laughs> and upon waking up, I usually don't bump into a wall, although that can happen too. So it's so neat to see directly, witness, that all the stuff we take so much for granted is second hand. It comes later. The waking up comes first. To think how and where I am comes then. And that I am, that thought, that I'm here, is it a thought or is it a fact, being here? Because there are spiritual practices which focus on the I am. I've never done this myself. Sometimes people who read those books come to me and say, how do I do this? I'm confused. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> to me, to, to practice I am is still thinking I am, but to listen needs no thinking. That I'm listening. To say I am is, is language. And of course, in those spiritual practices, the, the bottom line is drop the I am. So there's nothing conceptualized, no possibility for conceptualization. So the wind is blowing freely. You could say, well, wait a minute, I'm already, I've already made a concept out of this wind. I can see it, I can see visually the, these leaves turning to silver green back and forth, branches creaking, I can see it. That's all right. See that you're seeing a picture and then listen again. With or without picture, it doesn't matter. All kinds of things happen in this amazing human organism and heart. And 
And the most amazing of all is that it can all be aware. Freely. Freely meaning non-judgmentally, not with accompanying thoughts. It shouldn't be this way. If that happens, as it happens very habitually, catch it. Don't go with it. This moment need not be judged. It speaks for itself. When the mind and heart and body is open. Somebody reported that the more this work goes on of looking, listening inwardly, coming upon oneself, these layers of stuff, stuff when, to one's amazement, one has to say, well, I was never aware of this. And here it is, it comes into view. And wanted or not, with coming in view may come anxiety or resistance. One doesn't want to be this way. One doesn't even quite know why anxiety comes up about seeing oneself freshly. One can ask any time, why? Why this anxiety about discovering stuff about myself? And these are usually the so-called negative things that one feels anxious about, maybe jealousy or envy, anger or whatever. Is it because it doesn't fit the image of how I want to be? how I've seen myself to be, how I've presented myself to others as being, how I've been told I was by my parents or shouldn't be. All this builds up the image and is so strong and doesn't want to concede that we're not like the image we have of ourselves. But it does move aside a bit or else nothing could be discovered. It's much easier to find out about oneself if there's less and less clinging to imagery about ourselves. We don't need those, even though it feels as though we couldn't live without them. But they block us at every turn. And when this happens, that images are less held on to, more seen through as just being built up stuff which is unrealistic, not revealing of truth. As this is seen more and more, it's easier to come in touch with what goes on from moment to moment without suffering so tremendously about what is being discovered. Not identifying with it as saying, this is me and it shouldn't be me. It's what it is. It's what comes up in human beings, in relationship. Sometimes genetically coded, encoded, since our early developmental forming as animals, territorialism, rivalry, sexual rivalry, jealousy, wanting to get out the intruder. Animals are relatively, relatively gentle about it. They don't usually kill each other. Although in locking horns, if one watches some of these animal movies, there's often blood flowing. But then somehow or other, there seems to be an innate wisdom for the weaker one to get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> Not stick around.
and not draft allies to move in with greater force. <laughs> but even apart of, apart from how the reality of ourselves compares with the ideal images that are held on to, apart from that, With doing this work more and more, there is less and less resistance, inwardly, outwardly. And so very quickly, a fear or an anger is touched, a conditioning cell. A thought arises and one sees it's already a fearful sensation or an angry sensation. Things which before were well padded stashed away. So, not to expect that doing meditative work, quiet sitting, retreating, will all be a continuous bed of roses. <laughs> <laughs> People who do it realize it's not the case. So, the more expectations drop away, the clearer the sight, clearer the touch of what's there. And if anxiety arises, pain or guilt, whatever the habit may be, strong for all of us, see it as that. And not see it as necessarily signaling true danger. One thought can totally set off the alarm system in the body so that it's ready for what we call fearful responses or fright responses, to run, to aggress, to run, to fight, or to, to freeze. One thought can set this off in this physiology. Amazing to watch, particularly if one has caught the thought and realizes it's just the thought. If the thought escaped the attention, then one is left with all this stuff and inwardly, adrenaline poured out, the intestines rumbling, because uh, I once read a very uh, revealing um, account of this by a physiologist, or I don't know what he was, saying that if an animal needs to run away, get away from danger, it needs to eliminate, to become light, to stop eating, not feel hungry, so it doesn't keep nibbling while a lion approaches. <laughs> not copulate. It's in, not indicated in a, in a moment of danger. So all of these happy things fall away. And instead, there's aroused a lot of chemicals to be strong in running or fighting. Now, if one thought can arouse these chemicals, as it does, one can observe it in oneself, where are they all going to go if we just sit someplace in an office or here on the mat? Particularly if this signal is taken for serious, if one thinks there is really danger around, doesn't see it's just a thought about the past, present, and future. So, here. We're left with all of this rumbling inside. Can it be allowed to, to, to do its thing, to come and go without making more out of it and keeping the body in further suspense or agitation by thinking it's, I don't want to feel this way, there must be something dangerous, looking for danger, and we'll always find another danger. The stored mind, memory mind, is so fertile. Or just sit with this as the wind blows strongly. Letting it be completely felt without resistance. 
carefully and yet not excluding anything else that's happening. Because every moment is always a total happening of everything there is. So to be careful with evaluating the fact that what may be easier in touch with fear or whatever the emotion may be, pain, but to see it as an opportunity to look at it, look through it, be with it, feel it out completely, and let it go, which it does and will on its own body is not further aroused and triggered by secondary and tertiary thoughts about oneself. How poor it is that on my fifth or tenth retreat I still feel anxiety. This is such a useless thought. Rather discover about it. One person mentioned that he discovered we were talking about that effort, that attention takes effort. Being attentive takes effort. And it doesn't need to be willpower generated effort. Just attending is, takes energy, let's put it that way. Effort, I usually associate that word with an I-centered wanting. I want something, so I have to make the effort to get there. But attending uses energy. And I read in this German book somebody gave me last spring, I've mentioned it before in retreats, about the brain made so that lay people can at least make a stab at reading it, attempt to read it. I read that attention takes tremendous amount of food by the brain. And the brain, the only food that the brain uses is sugar. I was happy to read that. <laughs> the brain, and this statistic stuck in my mind, although there's still a possibility I remember it wrong. The brain is only one, two percent of the total organism in volume, and yet it uses 20 percent of the food. So, Many people, and I said it myself when I started this thing, going to Sashin, I felt I'd never worked so hard in all my life. Exhausted, and of course, kitchen people know what amounts of food get eaten. <laughs> Maybe not just because of the, of the attention work, but <laughs> what else is there to do but to eat? <laughs> We were talking about this in the meeting, that attention is effort. And one person said that he discovered that being in a mood and keeping that mood going takes more effort than being attentive. It's a beautiful discovery. And this, not meaning attentive to the mood, but just mooding along. <laughs> That's how I understood it. Also discovering that saying to oneself, I am depressed, has an impact that is unnecessary and misleading, not helpful, just to be with what's there attentively. Letting go of the, of the label. Label is powerful. Language is tremendously powerful. It hooks in associatively all that we know about, not just our own past quote-unquote depression, but other people's depressions and all we've read about it. We don't need that in being with this present mood, allowing it to show itself not doing anything about it. 
and no need to keep it and no need to push it away. Maybe we can talk about this a little bit more another time. Not to expect that as long as the mind dwells in the I mode, me and mine, my past, my future, as long there is dwelling in this mode, not to expect that there could be a state of fearlessness within that state. It's impossible. That state is ridden with fear and hope and defense mechanisms which always break down, but they can always be patched and repaired. There has to be a falling out of or stepping out of this I mode to see that fear only goes with that. It's not intrinsic. To our full being. Which does not mean that if one sees a, a tree crashing down, one runs right under it. Oh. Responsiveness is, is heightened and clar clarified when there's not all this eye mode stuff. So one sees and bows out of a dangerous situation if possible. And so I've never quite felt in watching, for instance, watching deer over the years. never felt that the word fear is really quite appropriate to their gracefully jumping out of sight when one approaches. And this changes also in the course of years, seasons, hunting season years seem to be much more, more cautious, careful. It seems maybe we're kidding ourselves, but maybe over the years it seems that the deer are less runny, less escaping from one's approach, particularly if one walks carefully. We've learned <coughs> to. But if they run or jump, sometimes only a little distance and they look around again, they're not afraid, they're attentive, they're looking. I'm not saying this all... Uh, all embracing awareness that we're talking about here. I'm not trying to project this onto a deer. But <clears throat> jumping away seems just the right move at the right time, full of energy and grace. And then out of, out of the thicket, if you're lucky, you may see two eyes watching. Often it's hard to see. Where did they jump to? You look in vain, become invisible. Out of fear, out of intelligence. Of course, it's not, you could say it's not complete intelligence because people here, retreatants, wouldn't do anything to the deer. Maybe that's why they appear a little bit tamer too particularly the little ones who haven't learned yet. So, is fear intrinsic to our being? Granted that there is an intelligent move away from danger, from real true danger. Or has it always got to do with thoughts about myself? Which are not wrong. They're very deep. Very, very deeply conditioned. So not to have false expectations for a situation that cannot provide safety. Absence of fear. But to to meet the fear and let it show itself as it is 
and learn from it. With a mind that is not just discovering things about my fear, but open to the wind. We will end here for today.